Somehow, with the birth of Getter Robo and Mazinger Z, everybody and their brother wanted a giant robot. And lo and behold, they got them one after another. If you were a Japanese schoolboy in 1975, you could reasonably expect to see some giant monster getting thrashed by a robot, either live action or animated, on TV, after school, around 6 o'clock. You could also reliably expect that you'd be able to find toys of your robot of choice without much trouble. The real question is, who did you like best? There really wasn't a wrong answer, since under the hood, they were all pretty much the same. This is, of course, a gross generalization, but the trope of 13 to 20 year old teams of pilots, usually including either a girl or a fat kid in there, was essentially grown during this period of market saturation. But you know what they say, when you copy a copy of a copy, it all starts to come apart. The year was 1975, and with Get a Robo G about to hit the airwaves, everybody was dicing up a piece of robot pie to get a slice. Beating everyone to the punch was Brave Raidin, which was originally helmed by relative newcomer Yoshiyuki Tamino. Tamino had worked previously on Triton of the Sea, but Brave Raidin was his first directorial foray into the mecha genre. It made a significant impact on both the genre and his career, even though he only directed 26 episodes of the series proper. Brave Raidin, for its part, was something of an anomaly, as instead of a pure technological base, it was a mystical machine, and could transform instead of just swapping out parts like Get a Robo. Raidin, for his part, could also transform from robot to god bird mode to use his finishing moves, which made it an impressive little machine. Raidin's pilot, Akira Hibiki, is a descendant of the Mu race who vanished millennia ago, and he uses the robot to battle against the Demon Empire. The show ran for 50 episodes, and for the first time since Tetsujin 28 Go, was aired in the United States directly after its broadcast run. Mazinger and Getter Robo would have to follow Raidin instead of the other way around. But more on that later. Now, sharp-eyed fans may have noticed by this point that Astro Ganger, which predated Getter Robo and Mazinger Z, has yet to make an appearance. Well, the quality of that particular show is a matter of taste, the fact is that it's not really a giant robot show in the vein of typical mecha. Astro Ganger is a sentient machine, and was never piloted like a car or a fighter jet, or even by remote. While Astro Boy was also a sentient machine, his importance to the narrative of the mecha genre is impossible to understate. Astro Ganger himself is more along the lines of Ultraman, and thus merits a mention, however, he had about as much impact on the genre as some of the series I'll be explaining shortly. Thus concludes the footnote. Tatsunoko Productions, famous up to this point for Science Ninja Team Gachaman, also wanted in on the action. But rather than go with the typical kids fight monsters business, they decided to take it in a different direction. 1974's Space Battleship Yamato had proved popular enough that pitching a space adventure series was still palatable. And so Tekaman the Space Knight was born. While Tekaman is not a cyborg himself, he did transform with the aid of the Tech Set system and Pegasus a bulky humanoid machine that he rode around on. Tatsunoko got their hands on the robot genre fairly early, but the Tekaman legacy really wouldn't come into fruition for several decades. The next time a mecha showed up in a Tatsunoko work, it would be a far different beast. We already mentioned Kotetsu Jig in the Monsinger Z episode, but it bears mentioning as part of the globalization of mecha. The series focused on a young man who became a cyborg after a racing accident, like a certain other green-helmeted cyborg grasshopper superhero, and fights the forces of Yamatai, led by Queen Himika. But what really makes Kotetsu Jig important was the licensing. Toy company Migo used Jig and Panzeroid for their Micronauts line, and the show itself made it all the way to Italy and a few other Eurozone countries to great success. It would be part of a lineup in Latin America called El, El Festival de la Robots, and Jig, along with Guy King, Gakin, and Starzinger, extended its lifespan. The steel wouldn't stain for a few years yet. 1976 came around, and if you thought this episode covered a lot of robots already, buckle up, you're in for some chop. Like Mossinger Z, parts of Get a Robo and Steel Jig, Guy King was another Gona Guy pipe dream. However, Toei Animation, for whatever reason, decided that they were tired of dropping bank on this work and attempted to erase him from the series. Understandably incensed, Nagai would cease collaboration with Toei Animation, and the ensuing legal battle lasted over a decade. Mercifully, cooler heads eventually prevailed, and things got smoothed over. Gaiking was formed around the head of the Daiku Maryu, an unfortunately goony-looking machine that held important robot parts for the machine. 
Standing against them is the dark horror army of the planet Zella, who thinks it would be a better plan to take over than to immigrate to Earth. Sanjiro Suabuki is a former baseball player who takes to the cockpit as his psychic abilities are the only thing that make him a viable pilot for the Gai King robot. He'll need all the weapons that the Daikyu Maruyu has in its guts because the Zelan army has some particularly monstrous critters heading his way. However, Gai King didn't have nearly the stiff competition that the next series on the list did. Gowapa 5 Godam was the next swing that Tatsunoko took in the mecha genre. It was notable for having a female lead pilot, but very little else. Mainly what this series is remembered for is its losing out to UFO Grendizer in the ratings section, and subsequently getting shunted to a weekday slot where it languished until it was cancelled. Tatsunoko sadly learned the wrong lessons out of this one, as the series was not particularly bad, but merely overshadowed by a work by Go Nagai. There wouldn't be another female lead in a Tatsunoko work until Time Bokan 2000. Likewise, they decided to kick the robot angle to the curb until several years later. Geiking first aired on April 1st, 1976, Grendizer and Godam on the 5th, and the next series on the list was on April 6th. It's a 12 mech pileup. UFO warrior Diapolon fared far better than Godam, but only by dint of not failing miserably. It was barely on the air before a new robot show came roaring onto the scene, and by now, we finally are getting somewhere. Cho Denji Robo Combattler V came roaring onto the scene with two very important facets up its mechanical sleeves. It codified the five-man robot pilot squad that would later become a staple of Super Sentai, as well as a certain lion-themed robot that will be covered in later episodes. It also introduced the idea of building a robot around a toy, rather than the toy around the robot. Getter Robo was a smash hit, but it was a design nightmare for people trying to crank out toys based on it. Since Getter Robo's main draw was transforming, and the design itself had no real bearing on reality, Combattler V was the logical extension. The machine could part itself out and reform the same way, but it also led to goofy design choices like making the feet of the robot a completely separate machine. Regardless, Combattler V was a hit for Toei, who had very recently parted ways with their cash cow, Go Nagai. Combattler's pilots should be familiar to anyone who's watched Power Rangers in the last 20 years, as they're basically the same character used for the Sentai plots. Hioma, their leader, is a brash motorcycle jockey, Juzo is an Olympic marksman, Daisaku is a fat judoka, Chizuru is a woman, and Kosuke is a kid genius. If this all sounds like I'm re-explaining Getter Robo, trust me, it's not your imagination. Still, for all its faults as a shallow imitation of Get a Robo, it makes headways in storytelling that other robot shows really didn't make at that time. Garuda and the Cambellians trying to reclaim Earth were a whole lot more directly brutal than Emperor Gore or Dr. Hell, and weren't afraid of engaging the Combattler team directly if the situation called for it, especially out of their robot. Unlike some of the other series in this episode, it's worth a look. It would also garner itself two sequels in the coming years, though they would not be direct sequels like Get a Robo had. Gonagai was, at this point, selling whatever he damn well pleased to animation studios, and Groiser X was a fine example of this. While it displayed the more refined storytelling and robot design that Nagai had developed in the intervening years, it still didn't have near the impact that Knack Productions, also responsible for Astro Ganger, would have liked. Groiser X's most important claim to fame was making it into Shin Mazinger Z Impact in 2009, where it was used to sink a battleship. Sadly, this mirrors precisely what Groiser X did. Sink. Blocker Gundan 4 Machine Blaster was another ill-fated mecha show whose biggest claim to fame was that it had a long name, and that it featured Tesho Genda in an early role. Likewise, Magna Robo Gakin had a lady pilot in one of the main seats, but aside from a long list of super moves and a long transformation sequence, it didn't make anywhere near the splash that Toei was hoping for. That brings us to 1977, and this is where I need to pause. Let's talk legacy. Brave Riding was something of a sleeper hit for a lot of people, and since it was being broadcast over in the States, Mattel had the first inklings of bringing over the series for the Western market. So with one fell swoop, they snatched up the licenses and started producing Shogun Warriors. It was a massive undertaking and featured Raidin, Getter Robo G, Great Mazinger, Combattler V, and Voltes V, Guy King, 
Grendizer, and even Leopardon, the Japanese Spider-Man's vehicle. It was absolutely brilliant, and an absolute failure. New regulations had been put in place for toys, and a lot of the spring-loaded missiles, fists, and other bladed weaponry were right out. So with remodels looming, a deadline on the license on the horizon, and an inability to move inferior product, the Shogun Warriors were all but gone by 1980. Brave Riding would go on to get two more series made out of it, one called Riding the Superior in 1996, which was more akin to Tekaman Blade than the original series. In 2007, there was also a reboot simply entitled Raiding, which was more in the vein of the original. Tekaman would also get a reboot in 1992 called Tekaman Blade. This one was much better paced, plotted, animated, and had a severely dark angle to it. However, it did suffer from a stock footage overload. The later Tekaman Blade 2 OVA fared much better. Both Gaiking and Kotetsu Jig would get reboots in the mid-2000s to various degrees of success. Jig lucked out and got directed by Jun Kawagoe, who's most at home with rebooting Go Nagai and Get a Robo Works. So with all this under our belts, we're about to hit a very dark patch in Super Robot history. 1977 and 1978 saw some big changes to the genre, and the next time, we're going to find out why he's called Kill Em All. Big Victory! Oh, buying one, two, three, four, five, six, to get you down. Like you, you got to tell me no more. Saying no sense in the combat or laughing. Show them the old, the old. Show them the old, the old. 